Welcome to the Creatures of the Night podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Chris Duncan, and... I'm Wendy Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Wendy Duncan. <laughs> we got married over the weekend. <laughs> oh my God, it was a beautiful ceremony. You guys totally should have been there. <laughs> mm. Where did we get married? Where? Was it New England? Yeah, what, what part of the... U.S. did we get married? Did we do like a, um, what is one of the things called where you uh, you put all your money into a spot and you go to an island or whatever? Destination what weddings? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Did we have a destination wedding? <laughs> yes. We went to the Caribbean. Uh, nice. No, totally this time of year, I get married in your neck of the woods, like on the beach. Because yeah, it'd be really nice, nice and cool. And then it would yeah. be so pretty. Not here. Oh my God. You don't want to be outside. <laughs> <laughs> Arizona is good for springtime weddings and fall weddings, I hear. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Right now, yeah. it's kind of like, I'm not going out there to even check the fucking mail. I don't care. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> While you're walking, your flesh is melting off of your face. <laughs> you're like, it's just junk mail anyways. <laughs> it's not important. My mailman oh. probably hates me because I do let that shit collect for days before oh, do I you go really? and get oh. it. Yeah. They're like, I'm going to stuff it in there at some point. Do you have to deal with like spiders and bugs crawling up into your mailbox too? Like that's the cool shady spot. So that's where they're hibernating. And then they have like all your mail and stuff too. So they're like, yay, bedding. <laughs> no, I'm surprised <laughs> they haven't, you know, figured that idea out though. I've never had a spider in there. We have those, oh. you know, well, you have it too. You have to go to a spot and get your mail. So you have a mailbox with everybody else's mailbox. And I don't know, maybe they're super sealed so the spiders don't get in there or anything. It's not like the ones that are just on your porch or in your yard. That would probably collect <laughs> snakes and all kinds of shit. But Oh, man. Speaking of spiders, um, I evicted a whole colony today from my basement. And sad to report that some of the spiders also lost their lives during the eviction today from my basement. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know... It's gross down there, and I got the fridge, um, so now I have a basement fridge. I had to clean everything out and, like I said, do some spider evictions, but man, it is nice Did you nice give them a 30-day notice? I mean, like, I don't know that they you can knew. just kick them out like that. I don't know if most spiders actually live for 30 days in this house anyways, but <laughs> I knew that they, they had a short lifespan anyways, so I was just hoping for the best. I went in there with the blowtorch that you could hear all the little spider screams. <laughs> 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 that was harsh, man. Yeah, no. But it was it was funny because as my husband was leaving to go get my son, there was this one creepy crawler that just shot down from the ceiling. No. And he was all like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what is that? And of course, my husband's like, it's just a daddy long legs. Yeah, but this one was humongous. Like he had been living up there forever. So, you know, I joked a second ago and was like, yeah, I don't think they, they live for 30 days. I think he's been here as for long as I've years. been here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he was the fastest moving daddy long legs I'd ever seen because when I, <laughs> now granted, I am tired because I've been in my hump trying to clean out the garage in the basement all day so I was a little slower in getting to him also he's a spider so it's not like I was trying to get to him quickly I just I have laundry down there and I didn't want him being like okay I'm gonna go run and hide in this stuff he <laughs> booked it he booked it he was like uh uh I know her I've seen what she's done to my other family members blah 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 and he booked it and I had to like, so I'm stomping everywhere and I hurt my ankle in the process because I'm super dumb and finally I got him and that's the end of the story. That's all I've got for you. The end. But <laughs> at least you got him though because it's the worst when they get away and you're like, I don't know where it is now. <laughs> Dude, I'm so pumped up. I know you can't tell from my voice and from the long story about uh, my basement and spider deaths, but... <laughs> I cannot believe that we recently had over 2,000 downloads. I know. And we're like over, over that. Yes. And I know this doesn't sound like big numbers to you guys. Our podcast released like late, late, late Sunday night. It's really like Monday. So by Friday, Saturday, our downloads tend to taper off. For the last two days, they've been like awesome. Like they've been higher than they've ever been on a Friday and Saturday. I don't know what we're doing. We had 16 downloads in one day in the UK. I just love, what? <laughs> I love when they're in other countries because I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know. How did you find us? Yeah, I'm just <laughs> like, oh my God, somebody. I act as if 
social media doesn't exist and that you can connect with other people in other countries and parts of the world. But it just always is impressive to me. Well, it is very impressive to me, too. And it was just super exciting to, to hear from you that we had over 2000 downloads because like, wow, like, and with that said, I've had like six more followers on Twitter. So I know that doesn't really help. (laughs) But I was so excited about that. Yes. Speaking of social media, we are rocking and are rolling. It's the small victories, you know, it really is. (laughs) We're we're just super psyched that anyone that isn't related to us is listening to this podcast. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Because it's it's usually you know, you got to arm wrestle them into listening first of all and they're like I already get to hear your crazy bullshit on the regular do I have to hear it on the radio also <laughs> like, I don't yes. even think they listen I think that we just push them to, to hey can you just put it on your phone and hit subscribe right. and yeah, like right. let it automatically download you never have to listen to it don't worry about it right but I know that like we don't have 2,000 family members that are doing that so <laughs> I know no one in the UK you know I know right? you know I don't have family members in Washington or are even in California and we have downloads. So I'm like, I know this is a stranger, everybody. Look. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they found our podcast. It's so exciting. They did. Yeah. I, that's what I wanted to, I wanted to at least take a second and thank everybody that listens to us and uh, that subscribes to us and returns each week to hear more of our stories because it, it really just means so, so much to us. We love to talk as if you didn't know that, but we love to talk about all of these exciting haunted locations and the history that goes along with them. And the fact that you all are downloading the show each week means that many of you also have the same interest. And we've said it before that it seemed like for a real long time that many of the locations that we ended up visiting where there were other investigators there, that it seemed like they were very standoffish or as if there was um, some type of a competition. There was just no friendly, you know, hi, nice to meet you. Where are you from? Tell me what you've experienced and I'll tell you what I've experienced. It was always so weird for us. Now, not everyone we've met along the way was like that. And to be clear, we have met some really incredible people. But again, just to reiterate, It's just good to know that there are others out there that also are interested in the same thing. And I feel that now having 2,000 plus downloads, that not everyone listening is of the mindset that there is a competitive nature when discussing the paranormal. Yeah, it's supposed to be a community of people interested in the same thing, like-minded people. And even if they're not exactly like-minded, but we all have this interest, so we should share our experiences and how we get involved with that, you know, so that we can share ideas because there isn't a set way. It's just cool to like connect with people too. And that's, and that's exactly why we do this podcast is to hear ourselves talk. And uh, <laughs> as we're so conceited. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I just enjoy researching the stories. I mean, and telling yeah. you about them and everything, which we were doing that before. But now it's like right. way more professional. You know, it's not half ass <laughs> where I'd be like, I saw this thing the other day. I can't yeah. really remember, but it's something like this. And I just make it up as I go along. Now I try to be like, <laughs> you know, Here's more facts, right. Facts, facts, facts. Yeah, facts, facts, facts. <laughs> I'm not making we it do, up we, anymore. Right. I know we've said that before that we love doing this podcast. And I hope that we're telling you all about great haunted places that you're just as fascinated with as we are to tell you about them. On the flip side, if you've got a story that you want to share with us or a place that you are dying to hear more about, then please write to us at Creatures of the Night paranormal at gmail.com sorry I swallowed in the middle of that that's a really long email address so let me (laughs) let me get it right we love hearing about haunted anything it's very much like the saying goes you had me at haunted I love that you know (laughs) it was like that thing that you sent me a picture of the other day I was like oh my god that's so perfect oh Um, yeah that fresh prince of bel-air thing that was like oh that uh, was so funny ghost hunters roll up to any haunted location they're like big cheese big cheese and cameras out and I just love putting off any of my other important stuff to do um (laughs) just so that I can read more about the paranormal you know sometimes dinner gets late you know out to the table or I'm even late getting out the door in the morning because I'm looking into more hauntings or ghostly related anything shit sometimes I write my stories for the podcast so long that I have to go back and take stuff out just because I keep finding more and more to tell you about 
I mean, we really just can't get enough of it. So stop thinking that you're going to bother us with your stories and write to us at that email address that I mentioned. And here it is again, in case you didn't get it the first time. It's creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com. Sweet. Yes. Send us stories. So you can send us like locations. Like if you've been somewhere that we haven't talked about that you're like, oh, my God, you've got to check out this place. It's totally cool. This happened to me, blah, blah, blah. Then we'll dig into it more and it could turn into a podcast story. I get recommendations all the time and it just my list of so what I'm going to research next <laughs> is getting longer and longer. But we totally and I also want to go here. Yeah, that too. <laughs> gosh, That's like never ending. I got to win the lottery and quit my job. Make that dream happen. (laughs) Right. So that we can just visit all of these places that we're researching on a regular. I fall in love with them, all of them, every show that we do. Because you dig into it so much. You just want to be there, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's, It's almost like I know this story so well that I was there. So it's almost like... You know, when you're trying to recount the places that you have actually been to, it's like, did I research that one or did I go, did I go there? I mean, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard for me to remember. I totally feel the same way. I mean, (laughs) we talked about this like a few weeks ago or whatever. We were talking about like what our favorite stories were so far and stuff. And when I think about some of those stories, I'm like, wait. Yeah, man, I felt like I was there. We didn't do that, did we? (laughs) No. And it doesn't help really when you, you know, you go and you watch the videos on uh, YouTube and you're doing the research because now you're actually partaking in what those other people experience by watching the YouTube videos too. So it's like, did, okay, did I dream it? Did I actually partake in that like physically or did it? You know, did I just watch it on YouTube? I can't remember. Right. Yeah, like I know I haven't been to Sweden, but I swear this house seems familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that story. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the last one that you just did, too, about the Q station. That's one of my favorites now as well. So speaking of stories, would you like to hear what I've cooked up for you today? I can't wait for my next place to fall in love with. <laughs> Oh, well, this one, you've kind of already been there. So let's take a little trip down memory lane. (laughs) I love that. Don't get too excited. Uh, Remember back like two weeks ago when I said that I had more on the Isles of Shoals? (laughs) Oh, what the fuck is wrong with me? I should have known. Hold on a second. Don't get too excited. (laughs) Well, no, that is fun stories and and it's exciting. (laughs) But it is like I'm acting like, oh, my God, I can't wait to hear what she's going to say. Wait. Oh, two weeks ago, you told us what you were going (laughs) to say. I guess I expected you to, you know, just go crazy. And, you know, a month from now, you'll get back to that story. You know, I was actually going to mix it up and be like, no, I just won't do this story because I think that would be funny. But then in like a month or so, I will probably be so over the story because I've already researched it. And I've already, (laughs) in my mind, I've already lived through the whole thing. So I probably would never even tell you guys. So I got to tell you now while it's fresh. Gotcha. Let's do it. All right. (laughs) So what I ended up saying at the end of that podcast was that I still had much more to tell you, but there was no way that I could have squeezed any more into that episode. But by the end of that show, I still had a whole island left that I needed to tell you about. And this one has a dark story that many New Englanders are already aware of. Though for anyone listening that is in the New England area, I have sprinkled in some goodies for you that you might not be familiar with. So don't bail on us just yet. The first part of the Creatures of the Night story, which was titled Frat Boy Ghosts, (laughs) only just touched on how crazy the Isles of Shoals are. Isn't that funny? It's such a crazy thing, Frat Boy Ghosts. (laughs) (laughs) So get ready. I have another story for you about a terrible tragedy that took place over a century ago that is still talked about here in New England today. This is, of course, the Smutty Nose Island Murders. Hold on. I spilt stuff on myself. (laughs) (laughs) I'd have something to some response to that if I wasn't wearing my drink. I was going to say, did you um, like it or was it so disgusting that you had to spit it right out? Like, this is no, I just have a hole in the bottom of my lip or something, I guess, Uh with everything that I drink. So, yeah. Mine's always coffee. That's why I always have to change my clothes like 40 times before I go to work. Uh, yeah, all the time. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's dangerous to drink coffee in the car for me Uh-oh. and make yeah. it work without stains on my clothes. But Right? That happened this week, didn't it? That was a hot dog. <laughs> oh, that's right. Hot dog. <laughs> I did wear that mustard all day, too. <laughs> it did not come out. Oh, and I bet you smelled vinegary then, too, huh? Yeah, it was it was awesome. That sucks. So speaking of hot dogs, I don't have any for you, but I have murder and they go hand in hand, right? So 
<laughs> I'm super excited about this story, though, because, you know, I've heard this story before, but it was so long ago that I forget because no. I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, no. So forgetful. So <laughs> it's a long story. And sadly, I've told I, I've, I've referenced it before a couple of times, too. So this is another one of those that I've got to get out there on the show so that I can kind of clean the slate just because I've, I've referenced it so many times. And if, if nobody knows what the heck I'm talking about. Now they're going to. Now they're going to get the whole kit and caboodle. So I'm going to tell all the details that I decided to leave into my story. Got it. <laughs> the murders, which occurred in 1873, remain one of New England's most grisly and mysterious murder mysteries. <laughs> you know how many times I've read this and I just realized that I had mysterious and mysteries like back to back? That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, there it is, guys. Let's start off by introducing you to our villain, Louis Wagner. This was a man that was down on his luck, struggling to secure work and barely making a living while fishing off of the Maine and New Hampshire waters near the Isles of Shoals. One day, his luck seemed to turn around, and John Hauntvent and his wife, Marin, decided to make it their business to see that Wagner was never in need of food or clothing and even went so far as to include him in John's prosperous fishing business. They took in this strange man, hoping to get him on his feet, and it seemed like things were on the up and up for poor old Lewis Wagner. Unfortunately, though, the haunt vents were extremely bad judges of character. That's just so shitty, man. They're just like, let's help this dude out. He just needs somebody to give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a reason nobody wanted to help him. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Their trust in and kindness towards Wagner proved to be a huge mistake. And on the morning of March 6th, 1873, they discovered just exactly how their kindness would be repaid. I bet it was flowers, chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> or murder, you know. Or murder. <laughs> I did introduce him as a villain for a reason. I don't think he was bringing chocolates to the island. When John Hauntvent and Marin arrived from Norway in 1868, they were the only people living on Smutty Nose Island in the Isles of Shoals. At dawn each day, John would navigate his schooner, named the Clarabella, to the fishing grounds and would draw his trawl lines. This man, <laughs> Look, I'm not going to go all New England on you because I had to look up what the half of this shit meant. <laughs> I was like, you're so versed in all these sailing references. <laughs> I am. That's what happens when you live out here. Nope. I actually, I asked my husband about this at first, and apparently there is a difference between a trawl line and a troll line. <laughs> Don't even get me started. But the one that is spelled T-R-A-W-L is the one that I am referring to. For anybody out there that is listening that's huge into fishing, there you go. I'm We're sure that was a trawl. thrilling conversation <laughs> and so educational. There's a couple of times when I mentioned things and he just knows, like when we were in the car and he just goes right on with the, with this. And I'm like, did you like just look that up on Wikipedia? Like, how do you know these things? He just soaks up information like a sponge sometimes. Anyways, dropping a trawl line means dropping a net in the water behind the boat to catch fish. Okay. Sometimes they're baited. It just depends on the trawl versus the troll, I guess. That's all I got for you. That's all I wanted to absorb in my sponge. <laughs> <laughs> that I like the idea of that kind of fishing. Right? That's what I was thinking. I'm like, man, you get crabs too, maybe some shrimp. I mean, you get like everything that way, right? Just yeah. whatever kind of, and then you can just chill on the boat. I don't know. I like it. I like the idea. So then John would sail to the market in nearby Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to sell off his bounty and buy more bait before sailing home late in the afternoon each day. He earned the respect from his friends and neighbors on the other islands, whose ages would rarely reach above 50. Mm. Yeah. Business was good, and in a short time, the haunt vents prospered and lived comfortably on their little island domain. Marin Haunt Vent was described as being a small woman, but not frail, and she was said to be gentle. She kept up the house while her husband worked and would apply her decorative touches by using bright paint and paper in their cottage. She always kept the sunny window shelves filled with an assortment of plants. She was like the main hipster of the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds just so freaking cute to me. I mean, I could just see her. She cherished their small red house, standing in contrast to the rundown fish sheds that were scattered along the rocky ledges of the island. 
but her only companion while John fished was her small dog, and its name was Renge. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I had to look that one up because, again, they're from Norway, and it's spelled ring with an E on the end. And I'm like, how am I actually supposed to pronounce this? Yeah. So we looked it up, and I even have a note here that it's supposed to be pronounced like stanky. <laughs> what? <laughs> No, like, you know, shoo, that's stanky. It's like Rangi. <laughs> that was my, my best way to remember how to pronounce it. I like it. I like how you, you work that out for yourself. That oh, seems like it. a terrible pet name, though, but whatever. I don't know what it means. I wonder if it's like, I don't know, beautiful dog or... Like best good- friend. Yeah, it must mean something or maybe not. Maybe it's just a cool-ass name. I don't know. She just thought it was funky and cute. Yeah. I mean, she was a funky gal, I think. So maybe that's how she worked it out. The Hauntvents lived on Smutty Nose for about two years before Louis Wagner came into their lives. Wagner was a dark, muscular, 28-year-old Prussian, I think, Prussian, with a thick accent. He seemed friendly enough to the Hauntvents, but others didn't quite trust the guy. The dude is like... (laughs) The dude is like the boyfriend that everyone knows is is trouble, you know, except for you for some reason. And you're always having to defend him to your friends. He never spoke of his shrouded past. And some had the impression he was always lurking and listening from the corner of the room, like pretending like he wasn't really listening to your conversation and trying to be all sneaky. But he's, yeah, snooping on you. Yeah. Wagner fished alone from Star, Malaga, and Cedar Islands, which are connected to Smutty Nose by seawalls and breakwaters. The three became close friends over the two years of their acquaintance, you know, basically like family. In May of 1871, Marin's happiness swelled with the arrival of her sister, Karen Christensen, also from Norway. The circumstances of Karen's arrival were somewhat sad, though, because she had recently lost a lover in Norway for whom she continuously mourned. Her sister, Cool Island Chicky, <laughs> basically moved her out to her place to help her get through this terrible time in her life. Several weeks after she moves in, Karen gets a position as a live-in maid with a family that was living on none other than Appledore Island. So going back to my other episode, the Frat Boy Ghosts episode on Appledore, you not only got your frightening ex-pirate butcher ghost, Philip Babb, <laughs> but also the cute Laka Waka, you know? By the way... Since I'm mentioning it, it might not be that awesome, the Laka Waka is what I mean, since so many people were so terrified of it. But being described as a glow warm, I just, I can't think that it was so terrible. I don't have any stories of it appearing with a knife, uh, only that it was always hanging out near the dead. So what? It's a little emo. Uh, That's all I got. I mean, and I wonder if she, Karen, ever saw anything weird there and who she was working for during her live-in job on Appledore. Mm. I know. I bet that was exciting. I but know. I like how you have to backtrack. You're like, I think I it's know. adorable, but you know, so <laughs> I'm making a, an announcement. I, I don't know it personally. If it terrified you, I guess that's a, a reasonable Thanks. emotion. <laughs> it is. It is a reasonable emotion. I You're just making sure I, you cover all your bases for how people feel. <laughs> About this cryptic. (laughs) Exactly. That's exactly where I was going with it. So back to Smutty Nose. One year passes and John's business continues to grow. So he hired on his super good buddy, Louis Wagner. And this was in June 1872 for anyone that is keeping up with that. (laughs) Wagner was also given a room in the Haunt Vents house. And everything at this point seemed to be great. Louis was basically accepted as a full-fledged member of the family. Unfortunately for everyone, things would soon change for the worse. October of that year, John's brother Matthew came from Norway to live on Smutty Nose. At this point, the living quarters at the Haunt Vent started to get a little tight because not only was Matthew there to stay, but now Marin's brother, Ivan Christensen, as well as his wife, Aneth, all decided that this cool island living was the way to go. And for the time being, all five were now staying at the adorable little cottage belonged to Marin and John. That's a lot of fucking people. It is. a Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's tight. Things are tight there. I wonder how many bathrooms she had. Probably just the one. 
just the one like outdoors probably, outdoors or something yeah. terrible like that it's like <laughs> they had to I don't think that everybody could have fit in the house and it's pretty chilly there so like are they tent camping outside are they all oh. just like everybody's on the floor there's no privacy that's why you don't hear anybody talking about any children uh, <laughs> so they're not getting time for that that's like some that's I don't watch this show but I mean if you recorded that shit, that's what like Big Brother would look like, right? Like yeah, when they right. put them all in that house together and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, that's sitting exactly in right. a corner bitching but about I, each other. <laughs> but I think that house was bigger, right? That I house is huge. House, uh, they yeah. can actually get away instead of truly just being in the corner and right. being like, "I hate that bitch. Her stew tastes like shit." And she's <laughs> like, "I can hear you. I'm, I'm right here. just across the room." <laughs> Uh, I think you have a very good idea of of how small this house was. Um, I'm going to go some more into that here shortly. So, yeah, I think you're you're dead on. No pun intended, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ivan and Matthew went to work for John, and Aneth helped Marin keep up the house shit. Louis Wagner stayed on with the haunt vents for five weeks after Matthew, Ivan, and Aneth arrived. Then he suddenly got hired on as a hand on another fishing schooner called the Addison Gilbert. And then he left Smutty Nose in November. Now, we assume from all the stories that the haunt vents felt like they had helped to get Lewis back on his feet. But, I mean, we don't know all the details surrounding his dismissal either. So what happens next? Oh, the Addison Gilbert wrecks. And Lewis is no longer employed. And is now reduced to working along the Portsmouth wharves, which I don't exactly know what that means, except that he was broke again. He earned so little at this point that he could barely manage to pay board to the Johnsons, whom now that's who he's living with. By March 1873, he was destitute. His shoes were worn, his clothes tattered, and he was late paying his rent. John, Matthew, and Ivan set sail on the morning of March 5th, 1873. When the trawl lines were in, they planned to <laughs> they planned to sell the catch in Portsmouth and buy bait arriving on the early train from Boston. At sea, they met a neighbor and asked him to stop by Smutty Nose and tell the women that the winds had changed in favor of sailing directly to mainland, so they wouldn't be stopping to leave one of the men on the island, as was their custom, and they'd be home later that evening instead. It was late afternoon when the women got the message. They had already prepared supper and decided to keep it hot until the men came home. Karen, now living on Smutty Nose, she had left her maid position to take up a seamstress job in Boston, but was visiting with the family before moving. Man, I wish I could have interviewed her. First of all, what was it like living on Apple Door? Did you leave because of the crazy haunted shit? <laughs> and in the 1800s, how the hell did you find out about a seamstress job in Boston that's while a, you're living on an island? <laughs> that is like, that is impressive. She's out there in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And then what? Somebody must have came out to visit and was like, yeah. you know, you're really good at that sewing thing over there. I got right. a job for you. I, that's the only thing I can think of. And then she's like, cool, sweet. I'll give my month's notice because I have to pack up my bags and move back to my buddy's house for a minute, pack up the rest of their shit, and then I'll see you. I mean, how do you just go? I don't even – I have no idea how this whole thing played out. There were no phones. There were no resumes. There was no Indeed back then. So it just <laughs> – Blowing my mind, the no story. Snagajob.com no snagajob.com or whatever. No, but <laughs> right. I mean, there were papers. So yeah. I guess they could have advertised jobs at that point. I mean, seems like it'd be pretty easy to find seamstress in a yeah. huge city like Boston that Boston. they wouldn't have to like necessarily advertise that. But yeah. yeah, it must have been somebody coming through that told her about the job. Yeah. So when the Clarabella docked in Portsmouth early that evening, Lewis Wagner was present to help tie the vessel to the wharf. He asked John and the others if they would be returning to Smutty Nose that evening. For some reason, they did not suspect anything, even though they mentioned thinking that seemed a little weird at the time. John explained that they would be home if the bait arrived on schedule. But if it was late, they would stay in port, bait the trawl lines, and return home in the morning. He then asked Wagner to help bait the lines, a chore which could consume an entire night. Wagner agreed and left the wharf. It was 7.30 that evening when Lewis was last seen in Portsmouth. He apparently learned the bait didn't arrive on the early train and, knowing John's profitable business as he did, concocted a plan to burglarize the haunt vent's home. 
On the shore of the Piscataqua River, which, by the way, Piscataqua, you remember being at my house and driving over that bridge? Yeah, the one we drove over like several times. Yeah, yeah that's even where we saw the crabs yeah. and all that. So that's feeding into the Piscataqua River. Gotcha. Wagner stole a dory within an hour after the owner had replaced the worn thole pins. <laughs> all, these, all these terms. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> okay, whatever. Oh. I'm not even so, going to ask. What's that? <laughs> no, I have to tell you that because it, it, this is actually crucial to, to know. Oh. These are the areas of where the oars sit on the boat. Oh, okay. So the guy just replaced them and he steals this man's boat. And then he rode past the darkened brick buildings and into the harbor and out to sea. The 12 mile row to the Isles of Shoals was difficult to say the least, but far from impossible for a skilled oarsman. In fact, John Hotbent made the three-hour trip alone in a whaling boat dozens of times. About 10 p.m., the three women in the Hotbent house decided to no longer wait up. They changed into their nightgowns, and Marin set up a bed for Karen in the kitchen because it was actually warmer there than being upstairs. She and Aneth then retired into their adjoining bedroom. By this time, Lewis approached in the dory. But rather than land in the cove where the Clarabella usually would dock, he rode to the far side of the island and disembarked on the rocky shore because he's super sneaky. Wait, who did he think was going to see him? <laughs> like, it's the middle of the fucking night. Right. And it's like, this kind of thing doesn't happen <laughs> all the time. Nobody right. else is on this damn island. That's hilarious that he was like, I don't want to get caught. I don't want anyone caught to by who? Right. It's that's funny that you mentioned that because it's like, you know, when you're sneaking into the graveyard at night to go and investigate, you're like, in the shadows, we go very slowly <laughs> because we don't want the cops to kick us out or, you know, arrest us or whatever. But this guy's like the same thing. I've got to go par- go park the boat uh, on the other side of the island just in case, <laughs> just to be sure, you know. <sighs> He uh, watches the lone cottage for several hours after the light coming through the windows disappeared. Once he was confident that the women were asleep, he trudged up the slope to the door of the house. He tried the door and found it was not bolted and swung it open easily. In the darkness of the kitchen, he closed the door behind him and jammed a piece of wood into the latch of the bedroom door, which Marin and Aneth slept unsuspecting. He intended to accomplish this raid undetected, but at the moment, Ringe started to bark. Did he forget they had a dog? I mean... I think so. Yeah, he did all of these things, and he's just, I don't know. Maybe Ringe is, like, so small that he's easy easy to forget about. Maybe he's not, like, a hound dog that barks all the damn time. I mean, I don't know. How would you forget that someone has this, this, yeah, this dog? Even small dogs are terrible at barking yeah. or whatever. Lexi Mine loves barks to all do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, she barked earlier in the episode, and I just kept right on going. <laughs> she is, barks all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, but it... I was about to say, it's good to see that he was trying not to murder them, but that's not right. does, that doesn't make his thievery <laughs> right. And it's, <laughs> he, you know, he's trying to wait until they go to sleep and slip in and out. Not that, like I said, doesn't make him a good person. And he's a dumbass. Why didn't he bring any like bacon or something? This dog should know who he is. Total dumbass. No kidding. Right? Yeah, the dog would know who. He, well, so the thing is, I, let me tell you a little bit more about this. You'll see, even if he had brought bacon, it wouldn't have really mattered. Gotcha. So, Rinke started to bark and woke Karen up, who again is sleeping in the kitchen. She suddenly saw the dark figure silhouetted against the window and asked, John, is that you? At the same time, Marin also sat up in bed and called out to her sister. Karen, is something wrong? Karen, still half asleep, replies, oh, John scared me. And with that, Wagner reached for a chair and struck a crippling blow out of the darkness. I'm just saying, like, he could have he could have got away with it. He could have just, yeah, it's John. It's John, go, <laughs> go back, back to bed. Go back to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he had plenty of opportunities here to not go through with this, but I don't know. He's dumb. The young woman screamed frantically as Wagner continued his assault. Karen, Karen, what's wrong? Marin shouted as she jumped out of bed and tugged at the door. Karen struggled to her feet as Wagner dealt another crushing blow. Battered and bleeding, she was thrown against the bedroom door, which happened to free the latch. Wagner rushed at her again, swinging, and this time he hit both Marin and Karen. Marin somehow managed to grab her sister during all of this, closing and barricading the door as Lewis tried to force his way in. Petrified, Aneth watched the gruesome scene from the corner of the room. 
She says, Aneth, run, hide. This is Marin, basically, as she's bolting the door from the inside. Yeah. Nearly incoherent, Aneth clambered out of the window and stood barefoot in the snow. She was frozen with fright. Run, Marin screeched, but it was too late. Wagner had given up trying to enter into the room and left the house. As he approached Aneth, his true identity was revealed in the moonlight. She says, Lewis, Lewis. Marin was able to see all of this through the window. And as Aneth stretched out her hands before him, he reached into the woodpile and seized the long handle of the axe. In one swift motion, he raised the instrument high into the starry night and drove the steel blade down into Aneth's head. Seeing that Aneth could no longer be helped, Marin turned her attention towards saving herself and her sister. She rushed to the bed where Karen was kneeling with her head on the mattress and tried to revive the dazed woman. She begged Karen. She said, Karen, we must run. But the poor young sister was on the verge of fainting and could only manage to say, no, no, I'm too tired. Meanwhile, Wagner was now returning with the axe. Marin knew that they were both doomed if she stayed together. So she hastily wrapped herself in a heavy skirt. And as Wagner entered the house, she climbed through the window into the bloodied snow with Ringe. So I said earlier Hang on a second. I think there's there's a reason why even if he brought bacon, it wouldn't have helped. Ringe was in the room with her. So. Okay. And he yeah. just heard a noise. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Like any old, ha- you know, dogs. Any o- dog. Yeah. My dogs are not hounds and they'll do the same damn no. thing. <laughs> so. Right. Right. I mean, if he had brought bacon, I think it might have been worse. A dog might have actually like unbolted that door before, <laughs> before <laughs> you know, like get that bacon. <laughs> so. She expected to find Wagner's boat in the cove and nearly panicked upon finding that it wasn't there. Her first impulse was to hide in the cellar of a vacant building close by, but she realized that Wagner would probably figure out that's where she went. Instead, she ran along the shore to the far side of the island. She passed the cottage with as much distance as she possibly could. At this time, her ears captured the agony of Karen. Shivering and clutching Ringe close, she crawled between two rocks near the water's edge where the pounding waves obliterated all other sounds. At the house, Karen was trying to escape through a window when Wagner burst into the room. He swung the axe widely. First he hits her, then he misses, then he broke the handle on the windowsill. At this point, Wagner wraps a handkerchief around Karen's throat and strangles her to death. What's the point? It didn't seem like she had a good outcome coming her way anyways. I I just think he's really dumb because he's using his energy in the wrong place, it seems like. This dude really, he just totally messed himself up from the get-go. He was already broken. Everyone know it. When he was caught coming into the house, he could have just been like, look, I'm so sorry. Can I just stay here the night? Instead yeah. of murdering everybody. Yeah, he totally could have made an excuse. Like, I, John sent me out here to check on you girls or whatever. Right. I mean, he's a part of the family. So unless, like you said, you don't know why he really moved out. Maybe they did part on kind of bad terms that made yeah. it suspicious. I still think he could have played it off. The girls, they would have been too scared to really question it, too. Yeah. I mean. I so now Wagner's a little freaked out because Marin is nowhere to be found. His bloody footprints were left all over the snow and showed that he had searched in circles looking for her. Ooh, what a creep. He went back to the house and dragged Aneth's body by the feet into the kitchen. Exhausted, he then brews a pot of tea. Leaving... <laughs> <laughs> this guy's the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. I mean, that's all there is to it. He, He's got to build his uh, strength back up. I don't know. He's like, man, I'm tired. I need some caffeine. Okay, so I was about to say he apparently doesn't wash his hands. I don't know what the sink situation was like in the 1800s. He probably would have had to go and pump some water. I mean, he was doing laps out on the island. He had plenty of time to do that, but he left blood stains on the handle of the teapot. <sighs> I mean, back then they didn't like fingerprint and footprint and stuff like that all that successfully. Right. So, I mean, I guess he, he doesn't think those things maybe matter. But who wants that shit in their tea? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's her own gross. blood i mean <laughs> <laughs> no i think the blood stains were from the ladies oh gosh i'm so dumb i didn't even <laughs> think about like blood splatter and all of that you know but back to the boat thing just real quick now i'm starting to wonder if he didn't park where he was supposed to or he normally does because he didn't want to give them an easy out isn't that creepy like if he was only going to rob the place 
but he, he prepared thought, for an attack. Yeah. Look, they say that if somebody is ballsy enough to break into your house while okay. you're there, whether whatever their intentions were, don't matter. They right. came into your home with you home. They're a threat. Obviously, these girls weren't prepared for anything like that. But for other people, you know, you got to protect no. yourself is all I'm saying. I can totally understand that because they're on an island, so they wouldn't have expected clearly because the front door was left unlocked. Yeah. They didn't expect anything like this to happen. So uh, on top of the pot of tea that he decided to brew, he also ate some food that he brought with him. He used a plate, a knife, and a fork from the Haunt Vents kitchen because he was parched, I suppose. <laughs> After ransacking the house and finding only $15. Whoa. That's such... Oh, it's just the shittiest part of the whole story. I mean, there's a lot of shitty parts here, but it's like th they lost their lives for, for nothing. And then here's the cherry on top of the shit pile. 15 bucks. That's just. It's but you awful. know what? That's what he fucking deserves. You yeah. know, like it. To, to be... Oh, he got more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I hope in that time when he was like realizing he just right. went through all of this and this is for... all you gained from it. Right. Uh, it's hard to say. I can't interview him either. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, left Annette's body on the floor beside a clock that had been knocked off the mantle in the struggle, which had stopped at seven minutes past one. It was almost eight the next morning before Marin left her hiding spot. And unable to get the attention of workmen on a neighboring island, she staggered on frozen feet across the breakwater connecting Smutty Nose and Malaga and waved her arms at the children of... And I apologize. I know I'm going to butcher this man's name. Jorg Ingerbredsden. Uh, that's the best I got. But his children were playing outside of their home on Appledore. Once alerted, Jorg rode the quarter mile to Marin's rescue. He returned her to the care of his wife, then gathered men with guns to search Smutty Nose. When the party landed on the small island, they discovered the terrible truth of what had happened. Later that afternoon, John and others alerted the authorities and word of the tragic assault spread fast. A description of Lewis Wagner was telegraphed to police throughout the coastal states, and the evening editions were filled with all the gory details. Of course they were. Two men, both of whom knew Wagner and were sure of the description, informed police that they had seen Wagner in Newcastle about 6 o'clock that morning. The stolen dory was also found in Newcastle near a place called Devil's Den. The new Tholpins, remember I mentioned them, that they had just been uh, replaced by right. the owner? The new Tholpins were worn almost a quarter of an inch. He was booking it. Yeah. He was <laughs> like, <laughs> really, I mean, they were smoking. <laughs> <laughs> After returning to the Johnsons, where he changed some of his clothes, Wagner had caught a 9 a.m. train for Boston. That evening, Boston police found him, and Wagner did not resist when arrested. The next day, Wagner was transferred from jail to the Boston Depot for a trip back to Portsmouth, followed by a crowd of more than 500 pissed-off folks. Fuck yeah. You know? <laughs> I definitely would have been in that uh, little army of 500 people. <laughs> At each depot along the route, the train was met by outraged citizens demanding his immediate demise. It was reported a crowd of 10,000 filled the streets of Portsmouth and narrowly missed tearing him to pieces when he arrived. Smutty Nose was in the jurisdiction of the state of Maine, and Wagner would have to be tried there. Three days later, when he was moved from Portsmouth to the train, a lynch mob of over 200 fishermen from the islands and the coast were waiting. <laughs> the police escort had to draw their revolvers. They were in also the company of bayonet-wielding Marines that were called from the Navy base. <laughs> but the mob was not easily subdued. The escort was showered with stones and bricks. The trial of Lewis Wagner commenced on June 9, 1873, and after nine days of testimony and 55 minutes of deliberation, he was found guilty as charged. Wagner broke out of jail within a week, but was recaptured in New Hampshire, and on June 25, 1875, 27 months after the crime, Wagner was led into a yard of the state prison in Thomaston, Maine, and was hanged. Um, now, there is there is actually some speculation that it really wasn't him, but everything else that I've read online says it's it was clearly him. So, I mean, I, I wasn't there. 
Uh, the ladies, you know, two of them died in the process. He was identified by one of them that had shouted his name who eventually died and the other one who saw him by moonlight. But of all of the people that they knew, he was the most likely of the suspects. Also, he was also identified by Marin, who survived. So, again, there is some conjecture that says he was innocently hung. But, again, I wasn't there, so I, I don't have more on that. I call bullshit. I think that yeah. somebody's just trying to give a different, like just trying to spice it up, but being like, yeah. ooh, maybe they were wrong. Yeah. There was this murderer going around or something like that. I mean, all of it lines up and makes sense. He knew how their home was set up and everything. And right. he knew that they were there by themselves. And one of the women ID'd him, you know? So, I mean, like, they would, would they just have pulled that out of their ass? Like, because maybe they were mad at him or something? Like, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem right. They had tried to help him for so long. I don't think they'd accuse him of murder if they were mad at him or not. We don't even know. We just kind of made that up. They probably just kicked him out because they were like, our family's living here now. You got to like yeah, grow right. up and be on your own. <laughs> right. Go so, find some other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm on board with that. I, I think that it was him. He was identified by Marin. Marin held uh, steady to her story. Like she never wavered. Basically, yeah. she identified him. I, I think that it was the times people were like, oh, she was shooken up. She doesn't know what she's talking about, that sort of bullshit. But again, I, I think that they made the right decision. They got the right man. It is kind of funny that they took 55 minutes to deliberate right. about it. I mean, were they just hungry and it was lunch break, you know? And so they, Maybe. it's like, like you what took know. so long? I mean, like, it seems like <laughs> it's kind of cut and dry, but okay. So, so maybe. Maybe there was a little more information. Maybe he had a really good lawyer that put some yeah. doubt in people's minds. But I don't know. I think they got the right guy. I think you're right. I think that back then, if they didn't like deliberate for more than 30 minutes and they didn't get paid for the full day or something like that. So they're like, <laughs> all right, let's just go for broke here. Let's go a whole 55 minutes. Let's do this. Let's play. And they all played like tic-tac-toe in the meantime. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's guilty, guilty, guilty. <laughs> he stole a boat. He ran off. He let the yep. police take him without any question. I mean, yeah. Right. And a lot of the facts that I'm giving you here, too, about him changing his clothes and hopping a train to Boston. I mean, that was all from the trial. So, I mean, why did he suddenly do that if he was destitute? Where did he get the fucking $15 to, to do that? Hmm. He decided to move out of town the very night that people he knew died. Right. And close like like family members. So, yeah, yeah it's it's pretty much uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I feel like they got the right guy here. I just I had to give you that because it is out there. And if you go fact checking me, you'll find that when you come across the story. Oh, and I was intending on doing that. I know. No, I know. I have to, I I have to. <laughs> I believe everything you tell me. <laughs> So Marin and John Hauntvent were never to live on the Isles of Shoals again. They moved to Portsmouth, where John continued working as a fisherman. However, visitors to the island have reported hearing what they claim to be sounds of women screaming. Some of the sounds of screaming have been traced right to an island cave, which happens to be the location where Marin took cover during this horrific night. Even though she survived the attack, Many think that she is continuously playing out the terrifying events that caused so much tragedy in her life. According to many others, Karen, Aneth, and even Louis Wagner all haunt the island as well. Can you imagine? I don't want to be stuck on that island with that guy. That sucks. No, that always sucks when you hear about that. Like, that's not where the killer died or anything, but he apparently still, he's left an imprint on that right. place. And so then he's still around. Right. So it, it might be residual because, it, like I said, Marin didn't even die there. But her, there is screaming coming from where she basically hid from him. So it's like it's replaying that memory constantly. And yeah, oh, it's I think tragic. it's possible, though. I mean, like, like, here we go, making up stories. But <laughs> I mean, had you lived through something like that and experienced it and then you found this cave to like and this is the like this is the only place you can hide and you're just either waiting for this guy to find you and kill you or you're you're living with the fact that you just watched people very close to you get murdered i mean Marin could have been in the cave crying you know what i mean yeah, crying exactly. and upset and all those could be all her yeah she just heard her sister basically dying yeah i'm a noisy crier when i'm really oh upset, me too so. oh yeah ugly crying and yeah. snorting and everything I, yeah I told yeah, yeah. <laughs> So among them may also be a spirit referred to as Lady Ghost. She was the subject of a 1992 children's novel titled Lady Ghosts of the Isles of Shoals. 
So, yeah. Why didn't my mom give me that book? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Audible came around and it was like, hey, it's time for you to get a new book. I was like, is this available? Nope. I'm like, why not? It's a children's book. I can totally get through that in a couple of days at least. <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed like a cute one. She's sometimes seen as a milky figure, but more often is heard whispering the words, he will return. Mm. She is sometimes also heard on Appledore. Many think she is the spirit of one of Blackbeard's wives. But as someone who loves to read way too deeply into things, this milky ghost sort of reminds me of the sister Karen. And possibly the words heard by many as he will return, maybe she's referring to her lost lover that she had mourned mm. or the murderer, Louis Wagner. Or even more twisted, could this have been her last dying thought and thinking that one of the men or her sister's own husband would return soon and hopefully end the madness that she was being put through? I don't know. Again, I'm just speculating. But yes, the lady ghost is there and often you will hear he will return I think they're all good possibilities. I know, right? It's just like, I, I can I please get there? You can actually get to Smutty Nose, but it's one of those situations where you got to know a guy who knows a guy or <laughs> you got to steal uh, a dory from uh, <laughs> some guy in Piscataqua row over there. And I don't think I've got the strength to do that, but... It's not one of those islands that the charter will take you to. Because like I said before, the charter only takes you to Star Island. That's the one with the hotel, yeah. uh, the Oceana Hotel. The other islands, some of them I've said before too, are privately owned. This one, it's just not one of those that you can you can get to unless you've got a boat and you know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to know a guy because... <laughs> like if you, were in, if you stole one of those little boats and then there's like bigger boats on the water, I would get like so nervous every time. Like, oh, I know the sea monster is going to get me <laughs> if I fall <laughs> out of this boat. I definitely do not have the bravery to get in a boat anyways. That's like a boat for one and start rowing across the ocean to get to an island. That is not my thing. No, nope. no. <laughs> I will trust whoever I paid on the charter to get me safely to that side. A big boat. Yes. <laughs> the final resting place for Karen Christensen and Aneth can be found at the South Street Cemetery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And as a pair of matching adjacent tombstones, which bear the nearly illegible epitaph, a sudden death, a striking call, a warning voice that speaks to all, to all be prepared to die. That's kind of dark, though. <laughs> It is kind of dark. It's also sad. You know, they were young. They had their full lives ahead of them. You know, Aneth was already married to Marin and Karen's brother, but she seemed to be like getting into this whole island living. And then Karen was about to go off to Boston and, and be this whole seamstress thing. So it's, it's, it's basically letting you know that life is short. You know, there's sometimes there's nothing that can be done in that situation when it's your turn to go. Mm -hmm. So it, it is sad. They're there in the, where did I say, the South Street Cemetery in Portsmouth, uh, which is allegedly a haunted cemetery. <laughs> so this brings me to my next haunted location uh, that I couldn't skip in telling you because, of course, it's the South Street Cemetery. Now, the South Street Cemetery, which is a tongue twister for me, if you couldn't tell already, mm -hmm. it isn't the official name of this location, but it's how it's most commonly known in the area. This lovely, slightly eerie cemetery is at the intersection of South Street and Sagamore Avenue, hence the name, South Street Cemetery, and is just a stone's throw away from downtown Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I highly recommend visiting this immense location prior to your trip out to Smutty Nose. Like I said, if you know a guy, who knows a guy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and not only to pay your respects to the two ladies that tragically lost their lives on that horrific night in 1873, but also because this place is oozing with coolness and paranormal activity. It's a beautiful cemetery. Oh, and it's massive. Mm -hmm. And it took me forever to find where Karen and Aneth were buried. But uh, one day uh, I took a day and just hiked the whole thing and finally actually found the directions online and it led me right to them. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gave up if you didn't have directions. I mean... Man. No, I just think that my inner sixth sense is going to drag me right to the spot where I want to be. But it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> you take your pendulum and you just let it like guide you or something. <laughs> <laughs> Lead me to their uh, graves. Uh, anyways, 
This cemetery has quite the number of hot spots. And I've read that if you plan to investigate this location, uh, be sure to pay close attention to the graves just outside of the cemetery walls. The feeling of fingers running along your neck or through your hair has been reported. Mm, that's very intimate. <laughs> it is. Also, I've read that women should be especially cautious near the woods uh, at those graves just outside of cemetery walls because there seems to be a very unpleasant male entity there, which is very weird. You know, you feel something and there is then this rather nasty old man hanging around to me. I'm thinking it's two different things because one wants to be noticed and the other one's like, y'all fuck off, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do they say it's the same thing? No, but it's it's just in the same area. So yeah. a lot of people group those two things as the same thing. Well, I mean, that is possible, I guess. And we're yeah. all moody people. I mean, like right. one day we're feeling it, the next day we're not. <laughs> I get yeah. it. It seems like it's two separate things, though. Yeah, because like it, it seems like one is very inviting and, and almost like, hey, I'm over here, you know, and then all of a sudden it's creepy old guy coming up. Yeah, well, unless he is like getting even more aggressive and that's not him just trying to run his fingers through your hair. That's him like trying to grab the back of your head or something, right. you know, oh, it's like very trying, violent, you know, he's trying so hard to grab your I hair. Know, he just hasn't figured be. it out. Just, <laughs> and all he's doing is just like it's like a oh, a nice breeze going through. Your <laughs> like, oh, that feels so good. And he's like, bitch, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> All right. Oh, and speaking of negative things, there is also a <laughs> there's also a crypt that tends to give off very bad feelings. This one is near the smaller entrance on the far side of the cemetery. The actual history of the cemetery provides an interesting explanation for why its apparent hot spots are so active. Research has revealed that at the elevated spot in the cemetery is where the gallows once stood in the 1700s. Mm. The earliest gallow being a hanging tree where two early executions, including Penelope Henry and Sarah Simpson, took place in 1739. They were said to have been turned off the back of the cart, in quotations, which means that after standing on a cart positioned beneath the gallows, that the cart basically right pulled away. away. Yeah. yeah. Leaving them kind of hanging. So one of the most well-known stories of that type of hanging was Ruth Blay. She was a 25-year-old unmarried school teacher. She was convicted of concealing the death of a newborn, which was later to have said, yeah, it was. Oh, this one is just, if you weren't pissed off earlier, this one's really going to piss you off. <laughs> She was convicted of concealing the death of a newborn, which was later said to have been a stillborn. According to the charges, Miss Blay had buried the infant beneath loose floorboards in her schoolroom. The corpse, wrapped in a cloak, was discovered by five-year-old Betsy Pettingill and some of her friends. Ruth Blay was immediately apprehended, and the young school teacher's trial was rushed. Given an extremely harsh sentence, even though the people of Portsmouth came to her defense, numerous briefs were filed with the courts requesting a reprieve for Miss Blay. Just one chance remained for her pardon on December 30th, 1768, the day that her execution was scheduled. But the sheriff decided not to wait. In fact, he changed the time of her hanging to an hour earlier than planned so that he wouldn't be late for dinner that evening. And that is documented, guys. He did not want to be late for dinner. According to the legend recorded by journalist C.W. Brewster in the mid-1800s, and I quote, As Ruth was carried through the streets, her shrieks filled the air. She was dressed in silk and was driven under the gallows in a cart. The crowd shouted angrily as High Sheriff Thomas Packer hastily positioned the cart beneath the gallows. He looped the noose around Ruth's neck and then with a quick command to the horses, drove the cart away leaving the young woman's body swinging from the rope. Sheriff Packer did not stop to look back. Instead, he drove the cart to arrive home in time for his meal. He was apparently unaware that, as he drove away, a rider had arrived at the gallows with an urgent letter. A stay of execution had been issued by the royal governor of New Hampshire, but it arrived minutes after Miss Blay's death. 
He must have been having fish for dinner because that doesn't keep very well. It doesn't reheat well either. So, I mean, like, I kind of get that he's like, my wife said dinner is going to be ready at five. I got to get home. It's you know, not going to be good later. How would you reheat it in the 1700s anyways? It's no, <laughs> it I don't done. even I don't even like reheating it now. I'm not, <laughs> see, you know, seafood, like, I don't know why shrimp and that kind of, well, just shrimp really is kind of okay to me, but yeah. I'll eat that cold. But not, yeah. not fish. Okay. So, so maybe that's what was going I guess. on. Yes. <laughs> uh, but nobody knows who the father of this baby was, right? No. She would knows. never say. No. I wonder, just, I just wonder if it's like the wife of, I mean, like, I just assume it's a married man she's sleeping with. That's insane. But that I just assume that. But I mean, nope, what if it I was a situation same. like that and it's somebody yeah. that was like, nope, 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 we've got to get this done so that she never lets that information out, you know? It's very possible. Somebody must have known something and wanted to keep her quiet. Yeah, I kind of feel that. I did read, I, I, originally I read a lot into this story and this is a long time ago because I had originally planned to do this one as one of our drive-bys when we were doing those back in the day. So I know where the cemetery is. I, I now know allegedly where the spot kind of is, but she never said who the father was. And the reason why she ended up burying it in the school is because she thought that was the safest place for the baby to be. Right. Um, well, it's also where she's at too. Right. So I mean, like it's a space that means something to her and that she right. could be there and visit every day or whatever. Right. It wasn't like a, and, and telling the story too, I, I didn't want to make it seem like a creepy thing. She buried her stillborn baby's body in underneath the school floorboards. This was kind of like the, she felt that this was the safest thing to, to do. She didn't have any intention of any children ever finding the body. It's just that, you know, kids are kids and who knows the kids. Snoopy little bitches. Yeah. And I <laughs> bet you a million bucks. Why is that kid going in the floorboards? I, right. I bet you for some reason that kid knew something was up. So uh, Ruth Blay was buried in an unmarked grave about 300 feet north of the small pond near the middle of South Street Cemetery and is thought to be the reason so many people capture a large number of ghostly anomalies in their photos. This also happens to be a hot spot for camera failure or equipment malfunction. So I'm a little more enticed knowing that there are, you know, there's more than one thing actually going on in the same location mm -hmm. because I don't know what these, uh, these ghostly anomalies are. I haven't actually found anything to share with you. <laughs> also, according to local lore and one of my favorite little Portsmouth oddities, the glowing gravestones. Now, these are said to be within a few feet from where Miss Blay's spirit has been contacted. But the real reason for the glowing stones has been researched over and over, and it's still unclear why these two stones glow while none others in the cemetery do. I personally have never made it to the cemetery at night to try to see this, but I have read varying accounts like it doesn't happen every night. Some people feel that their proximity to the pond and being under a full moon may be the cause, or maybe it has something to do with the composition of the stone themselves, like uh, maybe the limestone has some type of phosphorescence mixed into it. Yeah. Like waka. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the reason may be, it's an exciting phenomenon at a big, huge old cemetery that has reports of ghostly activity nearby. Now, for just a smidgen of history on the cemetery, and I saved this one for the end for a reason, back in the 1850s, it was agreed with a man by the name of Goodman William Cotton to make the original cemetery. So, South Street Cemetery is actually at least five cemeteries. You've got Cotton Burial Ground, Elmwood Cemetery, Proprietor's Burial Ground, Harmony Grove, and Sagamore Cemetery. Now you see why it's just called South Street Cemetery. Right. <laughs> Anyways, the first record for Cotton Burial Ground appeared in June of 1671. So Cotton was hired to fence the town's land and cut down the trees and the bushes, basically to clear it all out. For doing so, he was allowed to use the land for feeding his pasture for 20 years. How about that for some payment? Uh, <laughs> your cows will never go hungry. <laughs> At the same time, this land was to be used as a training field and, of course, to bury the deceased. So here you go. Many visitors have reportedly spotted ghostly soldiers marching along the eastern end of the cemetery. That's it. That's all I got for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out, wait, so he cleared the land 
It's a cemetery and training ground, and his cows are getting to eat there. Yeah, there's a lot of shit going on. So, so are the cows eating where the people are being buried? Yes. So that's a thing. That was a thing out here. I don't think it's a thing nowadays. So there are a lot of burials out here where there's like a slab uh, of cement that's on top of where the person was buried. And basically people did that so that the cows and the pigs would not tear up the ground where the, they were actually burying people, that they would have to go around where the bodies were. So the witch, the alleged witch that's buried up in Maine, everyone thought that she was a witch, but basically it's just a slab of stone so that the cattle, uh, Wouldn't just fuck like in this where case. she was buried. But it'll, they'd say the same thing kind of like with the vampires and stuff and everything. Right. They're, they're trying to prevent the dead from rising. Right. And right. really it's just trying to keep cows from, you know, digging a hole or I don't know that cows <laughs> do that. So, but pigs would, right? I don't know. Right. right. Yeah, they don't want them fucking it up, basically. There there are dead bodies under there. I don't know if they were burying them as deeply as they should have been. I mean, especially up here, you know, the shit freezes over. It's got to be hard as hell to dig through granite. I mean, I don't know. So they, they put a body in a coffin, stick it in the ground, they put a slab of cement on top of it. Yeah. But Well, they just yeah. don't want the eroding away right. either. If they yeah. start a hole, it can get worse and worse, like with oh, kind yeah. of some kind of weather element. Also, just fucking disrespectful of a cow's just taking yeah. a shit on top of a grave and stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, this is like why I'm like, wait, yeah. what? That's so... <laughs> But think about how pretty the flowers would be growing in that I mean, wow. yes, I thought about that, too. The <laughs> land is nice and fertilized, but it's yeah. kind of like that's, uh, you come to visit your loved one and it's like kind right of next fucking to stinks it. over here. A big pile of cow shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yeah. bit much. And I love cows, but I don't want yeah, I don't too. necessarily want to be in that deep with them. No, you want to go and visit your loved ones and not have to deal with, you right. know, their being right up in your face yeah <laughs> totally agree with you there but <laughs> but the training field I thought was really interesting too so they're they are burying the dead they are feeding the pasture or they're feeding the the animals in the pasture and they're also like shooting off bayonets because they're training out there too I mean, there's a lot of hated that. Like, yeah, (laughs) they probably didn't eat so well. They were probably like, (laughs) that had to been terrifying for them. Is all I'm saying. But yeah, it's a lot of multi-purpose going on there. So, right. Well, and it was a, it was a perfect spot. Actually, it's very convenient because it's inland. Uh, It's close to the seaport, but it's, it's in deep enough to where they could have like like I said, he cleared it out, so it must have been all I don't know, bushy or trees or something. I don't, I can't imagine this one guy cutting down all them trees though. But yeah, I don't know. It, it was the perfect spot. It turned into a bunch of different cemeteries, which is now uh, said to be an ideal location for ghost hunting. <laughs> so it's uh, it's a great place. It's very historic. It's massive and beautiful, especially in the fall. There is a wide variety of paranormal phenomenon, and it is conveniently located to the seacoast, <laughs> as if I haven't already spilled that. <laughs> also, according to the sign at the main entrance, the cemetery closes at 630. And from what I've read, the police patrol the area regularly. But for those of you risking the chance to investigate some of these reports, make sure you wear shoes suited for walking because this place is big and it is uneven and there are stones all over so no open toed shoes guys <laughs> yeah and watch where you're going so you don't trip over something but it gets yeah. dark there early in the winter so you can be in there after dark as long as it's before 6 30 oh yeah it does get dark here earlier in the winters but it also gets pretty cold if you're gonna do that beware of some of the types of anomalies that you might catch while you're out there because breath clearly makes Obviously. uh yes. yeah you yes. know what I'm saying yes there's there some all things. that and then the noise of the crunching of the snow and stuff like yes. that but yeah. I was going to say because of the glowing stones, if you wanted to try to catch that. But I guess you could probably see that from a distance without actually being in the cemetery as well. I have researched this a lot. And everything that I've found found out, because I know where those stones are exactly. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one of our old logos had the row of stones because I was just fascinated with them. 
you have to be on the opposite side of the pond to see these stones glowing. And it has to be, like I said, there's a lot of variants here. Some people say it's not every night. Some people say it's every night. Uh, some people say it's only under the moonlight. And some people say, yeah, it has to be somewhat cloudy. You know, it's like there's so many variants. And I don't know if somebody actually went out there and researched it to death or it just happened to be this scenario and they just documented their night there right and they so, said, so they the believe that, that that's what brings it yeah. about and that's what we're talking about in the very beginning about sharing information in this yes. paranormal community so we can build connections and see how it's done and what's working for people and stuff like that so i imagine that's people sharing well i saw it on this night yeah and it was like this so that's what you got to do it's probably more than likely it just happens randomly like right. all this other paranormal right. shit and so it's not always the elements that are helping provoke these things. It's, it's just right. what the spirits feel like that night. Yeah, I think so. Especially now knowing that it's in close proximity to where some bad shit kind of happened. And maybe it is the spirit of Ruth Blay and some night she's out and some night she's not. Maybe she's visiting somebody else on that night. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot in New Hampshire that she could go and, and I guess as a spirit wander around and do. I mean, I would. But <laughs> anyways, if you're planning on communicating with the spirits here, there, or anywhere, then why not head over to our shop at creaturesofthenightparanormal.com or uh, we even are on Etsy, uh, which is maybe where Ruth Blay is some nights. It's called the Spirit Emporium. <laughs> <laughs> she likes to shop on Etsy. Yeah, I would. I mean, yeah, she seems like an Etsy chick. Yeah, lots of <laughs> teachers are very like make it homemade and stuff and. Yeah, because they don't so that get paid very hard. well, which they should. They should get paid a whole lot more. You're yes. right, especially having to deal with that shit. <laughs> but yeah, come and visit us and get yourself some things that will help you with your paranormal investigation as well as protect you from some things that might try to do more than just communicate with you. And please let us know what you thought about this episode by writing to us at Creatures of the Night Paranormal at gmail.com or by visiting any of our forums of social media. And get ready for this list. It's COTN Paranormal on Facebook and Twitter. And COTN underscore paranormal on Instagram. There will be pictures going up this week. And you can like, comment on, share, or just talk about them secretly if you need to. <laughs> We'd prefer <laughs> if you talk to us about it. <laughs> but if you want to just talk amongst yourself, spread yeah. the word, ask other people to listen to our podcast, you know, I'm not be begging great. here. I'm just su suggesting. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget to like and subscribe and review and comment. And like I said way earlier, like several hours ago in this podcast, we <laughs> want to hear your stories. So write to us. We would love to share them too. Or if you don't want us talking about them, then just let us know. Hey, this is my story. I'm telling you because you guys won't stop begging, but don't share it. That's cool. That's odd, but yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're so stingy, but whatever. You, so I guess they would be sharing it with us. That's pretty nice. That's cool. Right. Yeah. And then it can be our secret altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's it. That's all I got for you because I had to save all the rest of us for some other story that I'll put together. <laughs> well, it's a lot of information. I mean, like you can go on about New England haunts. Like in to this whole podcast could just be about the shit that's haunted in your area. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I mean, like, there's just so many stories. Like I was saying earlier, people can give us suggestions on places. And like yeah. some people I know have done that. And it's like, I'm going to get to it, man, I promise. So that I keep finding this other shit. And there's just, it's amazing. There's so many locations. But like, you can go on and on forever about that area because every time I come up there to visit you that's what it's like it's like we're in the car and it's like that's haunted that's haunted right. there's a cemetery there's a cemetery we're at Walmart there's a cemetery in the parking right. lot I mean like next to the Taco Dunkin Bell. Donuts yeah right. <laughs> They're everywhere. Yeah. We were driving through uh, this little town uh, today as I was like drooling over all the houses and I'm like, I want to live there, want to live there. These all had their own personal family cemeteries, which <gasps> probably not their cemeteries, but they were like, no. there was a kid riding a bike just playing next to him because it's in his <laughs> damn yard. Where else are he going to play, you know? Like, can I have that, please? Look, I'm I'm sorry, guys, if you think that's morbid, but it's like that would give me the opportunity to go out there and connect even further with spirits. Yeah, and 
it's a resp- it's I know it sounds morbid and weird and strange and stuff like that, but it's really a respect for history and you know, we've seen personally that it's possible to speak to the other side. And so the idea of having that right in our backyard right. to, to test that out and keep working on it, it's amazing when it does happen. So yes. the idea of having it so close to you it just would be really cool. But it's also, it's a part of history. And if it's in on your property, then right. you guarantee that that family cemetery doesn't get moved, bulldozered, whatever. We've read too many stories about that kind of I shit. Know. So you, yeah. get, you would have the chance to honor those people and, and help preserve it. Because we have a respect for life. I know it doesn't sound like we do i know right <laughs> but we, we totally do the giggles and the excitement of dead people it's not it's not what you think it is i promise and if you're no. listening to this podcast i think you get that because yeah. you're into the same thing yeah 100 percent. you're one of the 2000 plus downloads that we've had so <laughs> i got it right that time right <laughs> yes <laughs> but thanks for sharing that because you know i love hearing about these stories it's just uh it's so cool All right. Well, join us again next week for another haunting tale. Amazing haunted story. I'm not good at this whole exit or intro thing. (laughs) Wrapping the shit up. (laughs) Yeah. Then we'll just say bye. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.